Tonight, the final ruling in Donald Trump's civil fraud trial ends with the former president fined $354 million. Today, we prove that no one is above the law, no matter how rich, powerful, or politically connected you are. It's a very sad day for, in my opinion, the country. The president and his sons fined for exaggerating the values of his real estate properties, including Mar-a-Lago. The judge citing the Trump family's, quote, complete lack of contrition and remorse. Trump's vow to appeal and make no mistake. Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is responsible. Vladimir Putin's most high profile critic, Alexei Navalny, dies in prison 24 hours after what would be his last court appearance. The outrage in Russia and around the world. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alt in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with that landmark ruling against former President Trump and his sons, along with other directors of the Trump Organization, with the judge already finding in December that Trump defrauded lenders, including banks, submitting false financial statements to obtain better rates on loans. Well, that judge now shooting down Trump's defense that valuing real estate is subjective, writing, when appraisals are starkly different, it's not evidence of a difference of opinion that that is evidence of deceit. Well, Trump is now also barred from doing business in New York for three years. His sons, Eric and Don Jr., barred for two years. And those uh, sons are also fined $4 million each. The Trump Organization has made clear it will appeal this ruling. But in the midst of his campaign for president, Trump's legal fees are mounting and much of them are being paid by campaign funds. Our team is standing by to break it all down. But we begin with ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky with the full story. Tonight's ruling strikes at the heart of Donald Trump's image, carefully crafted for decades. The former president fined a staggering $355 million and banned from doing business for three years in New York, the city where he built his fortune and made his name. The judge determining Trump flagrantly overvalued his signature properties in order to get favorable bank loans and insurance rates, things everyday Americans would never get away with. Donald Trump may have authored the art of the deal, but he perfected the art of the steal. Today, the court once again ruled in our favor and in favor of every hardworking American who plays by the rules. The most high profile examples of fraud, the Trump Tower penthouse. The Trump organization inflated its value by some $200 million, declaring it was 30,000 square feet. But Trump signed a document certifying it's a third that size, 11,000 square feet. And while Trump claimed his Mar-a-Lago resort was worth up to $600 million, its true assessed value was no more than $27 million. Today, Judge Arthur and Gorin writing Trump's complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological, calling Trump incapable of admitting the error of his ways. The former president attended 10 days of the trial. This trial is ridiculous. And on the witness stand, he attacked Judge and Gorin to his face, complaining, this is a very unfair trial. I hope the public is watching. In his ruling today, the judge knocked Trump's testimony for long, irrelevant speeches, adding his refusal to answer the questions directly or in some cases at all severely compromised his credibility. The judge today also punishing Trump's two eldest sons, Eric and Don Jr., who Trump entrusted with the company when he was president. Both brothers had testified all they did was sign documents their accountants prepared, insisting they didn't check what was actually in them. Whoever was bringing me a document, if it was more accounting, it was probably from accounting. If it was more legal, it would be from legal. And I'd, hey, like, are we okay signing this document? Do you believe it to be honest and accurate? And if they were okay with it, they'd have much more knowledge than I'd ever be able to amass. And so I would sign it. Eric Trump testifying, I don't think I'd be so nitty-gritty that I focused on details like this. This is just not what an executive at my level focuses on. But Judge Ngorin didn't buy it, fining Trump's sons $4 million each and banning them from doing business in New York for two years, declaring that without a significant penalty, Trump and his sons would be likely to continue their fraudulent ways. Moments ago, Trump lashing out. It's a very sad day for in my opinion, the country. A crooked New York State judge just ruled that I have to pay a fine of $355 million for having built a perfect company. Uh, great cash, great buildings, great everything. And Aaron joins me now right here on the set. Aaron, great to have you here. So let's talk about what happens next. We know this appeal is coming from the former president. 
Does he have to put any kind of money down, or is it just wait and see how the appeal plays out? Oh, no, he still has to come up with the money. He can either put all $355 million in escrow with the court, or he can post a portion of it as a bond with some pretty hefty interest using his properties and cash as collateral. And that's on top of the $83 million he needs to pay to E. Jean Carroll. So mm -hmm. this is really adding up for the former Yeah, person. and those properties aren't quite worth what he had said that they were worth. Aaron Katursky, we appreciate your reporting. Thank you for being here. And of course, late today, both Attorney General James and the former president responded to this ruling. So let's listen. We are holding Donald Trump accountable. We are holding him accountable for lying, cheating, and a lack of contrition and for flouting the rules that all of us must play by. It's all having to do with election interference. There were no victims because the banks made a lot of money. They made $100 million. All right, so what does this mean for Trump's businesses in New York, and what about that appeal that he's promising? For that, let's bring in former federal prosecutor and ABC News legal contributor, Khan Nowaday. Khan, thanks so much for being here. Good to have you. Let's break down this decision first. We've got those jaw-dropping fines. Trump and his company's on the hook for more than $350 million. His son's owing $4 million. And actually, I'm hearing that we actually just lost Khan. So instead, we're going to uh, skip ahead to John Santucci, uh, who runs our investigative unit here. John, we appreciate that. Executive editorial producer. Let's talk big picture politically here. Obviously, no person likes to be told that they have to pay $350 plus million. It's a question as to whether or not that's going to stick pending the appeal. What I would like to know from you, John, is does this ruling matter to his base at all? Do they care about it? Because, of course, seconds after the ruling came out, rather than a statement coming from Donald Trump, a fundraising email came first. And that is what Donald Trump is building his campaign off of. Look, we had four criminal indictments last year. Within a matter of each of those hitting the docket, an email would go out fundraising. That is what Donald Trump is doing over the course of this campaign, Trevor. Look, this is not a campaign about issues for Donald Trump. This is a campaign about taking the courthouse to the campaign trail. We have seen Donald Trump do that repeatedly. Look at the statement he made. We just played a clip of it for your viewers coming out of his Mar-a-Lago home today. Of course, that's another place where the FBI showed up to raid a couple years ago, a part of that case. But look, that is what Donald Trump is doing, making all of this about the unfair person persecution, uh, he calls it the witch hunt, the Joe Biden-led investigations, all of which is obviously not accurate. But nevertheless, that is Donald Trump's campaign message. It's not about cutting taxes. It's not about uh, ways to fix schools. It's about getting revenge and getting these criminal cases away. He often says that I'm the one standing in the way, which is why they are coming after me. Put me back in. I'll make it all better. And John, while we have you, I would love to get some greater context. If you could give us some perspective about what these payments mean in terms of portions of what Donald Trump is worth. He's, of course, branded as a billionaire. Sure. Uh, if he pays up all of this money and yeah. the E. Jean Carroll money, too, yep. are we talking about him draining all of his funds? Does it make a difference? Will he ever pay it at all? Well, on the will he ever pay it at all? I mean, Aaron talked with you a little bit about this a couple moments ago. The reality is he has to put it up in the interim, right? Because we're going through an appeals process on E. Jean Carroll. We fully expect, and Trump and his attorneys have said this, they're going to appeal this ruling from the New York uh, case that just came down tonight. But the reality is that Donald Donald Trump, forget the money for a second. Let, let's believe it or not, I'm actually going to say Donald Trump and money. Let's put it aside for 10 seconds if we can. Here is the bigger thing. This hurts Donald Trump's ego more than anything. You know, the first time I met Donald Trump in 2015, Trevor, he did with me what many friends of his told me he would do. He took me to the 26th floor of Trump Tower and he showed me his real estate. He showed me his prized possessions, the company he built. Look at Waltman Rink, he'd said to me. Look at the Plaza Hotel. I own that for a little bit. Made a lot of money selling it. That's Donald Trump's image. It was the image that catapulted him to the White House in 2015 and 16 as a successful businessman. Tonight, Trevor, he's been called a fraud by the state of New York. It's definitely a powerful ruling, although, of course, we do know a number of his supporters consider him now beyond a businessman and the savior of this country. John Santucci, we appreciate that 
perspective and always your reporting. And we do now have Khan Nowaday joining us. So Khan, let's bring you in here uh, uh, first and foremost. We talked about the payments there with John. What I would like to have you talk about uh, is the rulings regarding Donald Trump and his sons being able to perform business in the state of New York. What's your takeaway from the judge's ruling and how this is going to impact them moving forward? Sure. So I, I think, one, it's really powerful what the judge did. He's basically enjoined Donald Trump and his son from running a business in New York. Uh, he's also uh, prevented them from getting loans in New York. Now, I think it's a big statement. Now, ultimately, however, it's only for uh, a couple years. So they can come back. Uh, so proverbially speaking, the judge threw the book at both of them, but not a big, heavy book as he could have done. Let's talk about that appeal. So the judge wrote in his ruling today, Khan, that the frauds found here, quote, leap off the page and shock the conscience. This is not a close ruling based on what he's writing. He directly rejected a lot of Trump's core defenses. So what kind of argument do you think his legal team might make in this appeal? I don't see them having really any argument. And the reason for that is the judge here is the finder of fact. And the judge here is the one who determines the credibility of witnesses. The appeals court isn't going to go into those findings of fact. So I think the judge has really set a very tight record where Donald Trump is going to have very few means upon which to appeal. Uh, so Trump and his supporters have uh, kind of argued from the beginning this was a purely political case. And in fact, part of their argument, to the public at least, is that it was impossible for the former president to get a fair trial in New York City because New York City is liberal and thus the judge wouldn't like him. Just looking at the entirety of this case, does it, appeal to, does it appear to you to be a fair trial with a fair verdict here? It was an absolutely fair process. Donald Trump, his companies, his family got full process from the court, probably one would say more process than other people. It was done in open court. He had every opportunity to raise any factual defense he could. And frankly, he was given that opportunity and the judge found that he doesn't win. All right, Khan Nowaday, glad we got that, all those audio issues sorted out. Good to have you on as always. And thanks to John Santucci and Aaron Katursky. And in the meantime, now we want to move to that shocking news out of Russia today as Russian prison officials announced Vladimir Putin's best known critic, Alexei Navalny, is dead. But how did this happen? And also tonight, President Biden making it clear he believes that Putin was behind this. Our Martha Raddatz has the report. Tonight, the stunning reports of Alexei Navalny's death prompting mourners across Russia to brave arrest. But few were surprised by his death after his years-long opposition towards Vladimir Putin. Just yesterday, Navalny was seen via video link from one of the harshest penal colonies in Russia's Arctic Circle. The 47-year-old appeared gaunt, but seemingly healthy, and was even joking during a court hearing with the judge. Just hours later, Russian officials say Navalny fell ill after a walk in the prison and lost consciousness. They claim doctors spent 30 minutes trying to revive him before he was pronounced dead, saying the cause of his death was now, quote, being established. At the White House today, President Biden left no doubt who was to blame. Make no mistake, make no mistake. Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is responsible. Navalny's wife, Yulia, was in Munich, Germany today, attending a security conference and urged world leaders to hold Putin personally responsible. She received a standing ovation. Navalny has been the target of numerous attacks and attempts on his life over the years, most notoriously in 2020, when he fell ill aboard a flight from Siberia, moaning in agony poisoned by the deadly nerve agent Novichok. Navalny miraculously recovered after treatment in Germany, but decided to return to Russia knowing full well the risk he faced as Putin's fiercest critic. After the news of Navalny's death, Putin appeared in public today, but said nothing of it, smiling and appearing to be in high spirits. Over the years, Putin's critics have had a way of winding up dead. Just last August, the head of the mercenary Wagner group 
Yevgeny Prigozhin, who once marched his forces towards Moscow, was killed when a suspected bomb blew his plane out of the sky. Navalny knew he could face a similar fate and was asked what his message would be if he wound up dead. He said, you're not allowed to give up. If they decide to kill me, it means that we are incredibly strong. We need to utilize this power to not give up. A man a lot of people look to as a source of hope there in Russia and beyond it around the world. Martha Raddatz joins us now. So, Martha, how is this going to potentially impact the upcoming elections in Russia? Well, Trevor, Navalny supporters are calling on Russians to write in Navalny's name, but Vladimir Putin is expected to get six more years, and he's already been in power for essentially two decades. Trevor? Potentially in control till 2030. Martha Raddatz, thank you. And we want to dig deeper on this, so let's uh, bring in Julia Yaffe, a Russian-American journalist and founder and correspondent at Puck, who, Julia, I appreciate you making time for us. I know it's getting late where you are in Munich. You're at the Munich Security Conference, as is Navalny's wife, Yulia. Uh, so first and foremost, just what was the environment like there when this news broke? I think just shock, shock spreading through the uh, through the rooms here. It, it was like a bomb went off, and people whispering, "Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear?" Uh, it's just absolutely awful. And then, of course, Julian Navalny getting up and giving this incredible address, uh, maybe an hour after finding out that her husband had been uh, killed, and getting up there with tears in her eyes, defiance in her voice, and promising justice. And and that a day of justice will come for Putin for what he has done to her family and her country. It was uh, an incredible moment. And Ms. Navalny did also express some skepticism at the reports of her husband's death. Why, why do you think that is? Well, because she's right in that the Kremlin lies all the time. Uh, that said, from what I understand, uh, people close to Navalny are trying to verify reports of his death. His lawyers uh, flew out from Moscow to uh, visit the penal colony where uh, he was being held. Alexei Navalny is, of course, a towering figure there in Russia and has been maybe the most prominent thorn in the side of Vladimir Putin. What does his death mean to the opposition movement? Well, the opposition movement was really crushed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the introduction of military censorship, which caused about a million Russians to flee, many of them who were opposed to Putin. Um, Alexei Navalny, of course, stayed and maintained his relevance, but now with his death, there's a sense that the back of the opposition has been completely broken. And what I see my friends... Um, and Alexei's colleagues uh, saying on social media now is that their future is gone. Alexei was their future. There was a hope that uh, he was younger, he would outlive Putin, he would come into power and usher in a new, more hopeful, more optimistic and a democratic Russia. And now that he is dead, I mean, there was nobody like him, nobody like him. And it's hard to see anybody filling those shoes for a really long time. We have heard from many world leaders, both at the Munich Security Conference where you are and far beyond it, that there is going to be some kind of accountability or retribution. But how likely is that? Uh, frankly, I'm not sure what form it would take. We've already kicked out a lot of Russian spies from all over Western countries. Uh, we've sanctioned Russia up to the hilt. Putin, you could see in his interview with Tucker Carlson, you could see it in the remarks he made uh, on the factory floor today after he was told about Alexei Navalny's death. He's clearly riding high. He feels like the wind is at his back. He feels like he's winning in Ukraine, especially with the Ukraine aid uh, stalled, perhaps mortally in in U.S. Congress. And of course now Russia is heading towards its own elections that might keep Putin in power until 2030. Obviously there are at least some people in Russia that would like some kind of change. For a Russian that wanted that to happen, is there anything they could even do or is this a foregone conclusion there? Oh, it's definitely a foregone conclusion. There will be no opposition on the ballot. Um, you saw people coming out today when they heard the news all across Russia and Moscow as well, coming out and leaving flowers at monuments to political repressions of the past, to victims of those political repressions, and the police cracking down on them and arresting them. Uh, these are the people who are still in Russia and who are scared. People are living in fear and 
Navalny was the hope they ha for, that some of them had. Um, now they can't even put out flowers to commemorate him. So I think there is this sense that hope really died today, and it'll take a very long time for it to be resurrected. It's just so alarming what's happening there. Julia Yaffe, we thank you for your reporting and for your time. And President Biden today came before cameras to say Navalny's death shows the urgency of supporting Ukraine. Along the way, he blasted House Republicans for now taking a two-week break instead of negotiating vital military aid. Our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, reports from Washington. Tonight, President Biden says there's no question Vladimir Putin killed Alexei Navalny, and he called out House Republicans for refusing to pass new funding to help Ukraine fight Russia. But it's about time they step up, don't you think? Instead of going on a two-week vacation. Two weeks, they're walking away. Two weeks. What are they thinking? It's just reinforcing all the concern and, and, and almost, I won't say panic, but real concern about the United States being a reliable ally. The Senate has already passed Ukraine funding with bipartisan support. But in the House, Republicans spurred on by Donald Trump have pumped the brakes. Trump instead is encouraging Russia to attack our NATO allies if they don't contribute enough to defense spending. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. Biden today warning House Republicans, history is watching. We have to realize what we're dealing with with Putin. All of us should reject the dangerous statements made by the previous president that invited Russia to invade our NATO allies if they weren't paying up. So plenty for the president to talk about. Rachel Scott joins us now, but Rachel, President Biden did also speak about that new federal indictment of a former FBI informant. So what's he saying tonight? Yes, Trevor, and that former FBI informant is now accused of completely making up a story that President Biden accepted a $5 million bribe as vice president from a Ukrainian company that his son Hunter sat on the board of. The key here is that House Republicans have been using that as a justification to try to impeach President Biden. Well, tonight, the president is calling for the impeachment inquiry into him to be dropped, calling it outrageous from the very beginning, Trevor. Rachel Scott Forrest. Rachel, thank you. And next tonight, the dramatic new testimony in the high-stakes misconduct hearing for Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who is prosecuting Donald Trump for election interference in Georgia. Willis's father testified on his daughter's behalf. We'll tell you what he told the court today. Our Steve Osinsami is in Atlanta. The drama in this Georgia courtroom over whether Fulton County Prosecutor Fonnie Willis will continue to lead the election interference case here has come to this. I have one daughter. Uh, Fonnie Willis. Her father called to the witness stand, knocking down accusations that she was dating Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade before she hired him to help her prosecute former President Donald Trump and 18 others. Did you ever meet Mr. Wade in uh, the year 2019? Absolutely not. How about in the year 2020? Absolutely not. Did you ever see Mr. Wade at Miss uh, Willis's uh, Fulton County House in the year two, uh, 2021? Never. John Clifford Floyd, an experienced lawyer himself, says he was living with his daughter when lawyers from the Trump side of the courtroom say the relationship began. It is a lot. It is a lot. Willis lit up the witness stand yesterday. Trump and several of his co-defendants accused her of profiting from the relationship with money she was paying Wade to work the case. She says she paid him back for their romantic trips with cash. Her father says he taught her to keep cash at home. But it's a black thing, okay? You know, I was trained... And most black folks, they hide cash. All right, so let's bring in Steve Osinsami from Atlanta. And Steve, Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade say their relationship started after they began working on this case. So they argue there's no conflict of interest here. But what are the judge's options and what's the timeline overall here? Well, this hearing isn't even over yet. The lawyers are still arguing, closing arguments. There's going to be closing arguments in this case are going to be next week, probably the end of next week, the judge says. You know, in terms of what the judge's options are, we're told first he's not going to issue an immediate ruling, no ruling from the bench. But if he does decide to remove Fonnie Willis from this case, it would be unprecedented. It's a tall order. What would happen after that is the state would then appoint another prosecutor and it would be up to that prosecutor to decide whether the case moves forward. Trevor. A lot hinging on this. Steve Osinsami, thank you. 
And now to the fast moving winter storm heading east tonight. 70 million Americans on alert for snow and then brutal cold with wind chills in the teens. I take a look at this massive pile up in the snow on I-70. This is in Warren County, Missouri, and this system is now heading east tonight. So ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano timing it all out. Hey, Rob. All right, Trevor, different from this system earlier in the week. This one's going to be mostly all snow, really. It's much colder, and we're starting to ramp up our snow total forecast. This thing's becoming a little bit more robust, albeit fast moving. Winter storm warnings are posted for Philadelphia, Baltimore, now Columbus, Ohio, where the snow is falling there, and Indianapolis, Cincinnati, stretching over towards Pittsburgh. There's the low itself, sliding right over Charleston overnight tonight. And look how quickly the snow gets into D.C. by around midnight, if not sooner, and then up the I-95 corridor into New York City by 2 a.m. That's probably when the heaviest snow is going to be falling and that'll last till five six o'clock in the morning as the system quickly gets, gets out to sea leftover snow showers throughout the day but it'll pile up in the new york metro two to four inches expected uh, one to two in, in places like connecticut but upwards of five plus in the mountains of west virginia and certainly the suburbs of philadelphia could see close to a half a foot of snow it's going to be all snow and it's coming on a saturday so the kids will enjoy it it should be a little bit less disruptive than what we saw earlier this week but nonetheless uh, another winter storm. Yes, no Trevor. threat of remote learning. Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. Now to an ABC News exclusive with Prince Harry. Our Will Reeve sat down with him to talk about the king, where his relationship with the royal family stands now, and what's next for him and Meghan. Tonight, Prince Harry speaking for the first time about the moment he learned his father, King Charles, had been diagnosed with cancer. How did you get the news that the king was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. And what do we, without prying, um, what's sort of your outlook on, on his health? That stays between me and him. Harry didn't meet with his brother, Prince William but tells me he hopes his father's illness could have a unifying effect on the royal family. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I think um, any, any illness, any, any sickness brings, brings families together. The Duke and his wife, Duchess Meghan, giving us an all-access tour of the site of Harry's passion project, Invictus Games, Vancouver Whistler 2025. And Trevor Harry also telling me he enjoys living in California and has even considered becoming a U.S. citizen. Trevor? All right, Will Reeve, thank you very much. And we have still much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, the headlines on new developments in artificial intelligence that seem to be coming faster and faster. We're going to turn to an expert to break down the latest. But next, we travel to Iran to see how people feel about the nation's role in the Israel-Hamas war, where things stand more than four decades after the Iranian Revolution. Why are you here today? Because we want to support, support our countries. And we can uh, uh, war and uh, fight with enemies. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back. Amid growing fears of a widening regional conflict in the Middle East, tonight we take you to Iran as it marks the 45th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. Thousands of Iranians flooding the streets there, some waving Iranian flags, but others burning U.S. and Israeli flags. ABC's Mullah Langi has this report. Iranians celebrating the 45th anniversary of the 1979 Islamic Revolution that installed Ayatollah Khomeini as Iran's supreme leader. Hundreds of thousands gathering this week in Tehran. Young and old alike, including 14-year-old Ali Reza. Why are you here today? Because we want to support, support our countries. And we can uh, uh, war and uh, fight with enemies. Who's your enemy? Now, America and Israel. We speak to this father carrying an Iranian flag. He tells me that he still supports the revolution and hopes Iran's youth will stand by it too. There is the threat that Iran could get involved in, in a regional conflict with the U.S., with Israel. Is that something they're paying attention to? He says Iran has always been ready to confront anyone and that he'll obey whatever the supreme leader commands. Iran Revolutionary Guard military hardware on full display, a staggering show of force not lost on many of those in attendance. Iran is not afraid to use these, this man tells me. The celebratory mood at the ceremony punctuated with the occasional burning of the American and Israeli flags and chants of death to Israel and death to America. This against the backdrop of escalating tensions throughout the Middle East. We met 35-year-old Nilu Far. Iran getting involved in conflict in Gaza, getting involved in a war maybe with the U.S. Is that something Iranians no, no, are concerned about? No, uh, no, uh, we are not concerned about the war. And if uh, a war uh, happened, we are never afraid. We never deny Palestine and uh, support it forever uh, for uh, making it, make it free. They support Palestine because it's a genocide that happened in Gaza. Amir Ali Hajizeda who commands Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps Air Force with a measured warning, telling me the Americans know that they should not mess with Iran, and we are not warmongers. We do not seek war either. Speaking at Sunday's ceremony, Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, calling on Israel to be expelled from the UN for their military campaign on Gaza, echoing what a Hamas spokesman in Tehran told me. We Palestinians need simply to live as free, as secure, as any free or secure nation in the world, but not on the expense of a legitimate rights which has been granted by the very international community to us. Today, everybody is talking that Israel is an occupation. That's not me, it's United Nations. A common perception in the West is that, uh, is that Iran uh, controls Hamas or uh, will dictate what Hamas does. We are a family, and that is Iran, that is all the, the freedom fighters everywhere. So there's not orders coming from no, Tehran? No, 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 no. I mean, they are uh, uh, brothers, and we are also independent, free, uh, uh, freedom fighters. Earlier, miles away from the anniversary ceremony, we spoke with average Iranians who were concerned less about the state of the 45-year-old revolution and more about the state of the economy the country's high unemployment and crippling inflation. Shop owner Salman complaining to me the prices go up every day. Adjunct professor Sassan Karimi at the University of Tehran blames U.S. sanctions. There are many um, difficulties, and from my point of view, most of them uh, are related to the sanctions. Definitely we are experiencing, experiencing tough situation especially in the economic side, uh, but uh, the economy of Iran is not broken today. But so, getting worse. Definitely. 
Following the Hamas attack on Israel last October, the U.S. issued a second round of sanctions aimed at Hamas officials in Iran and members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The move targets what the U.S. describes as conduits for illicit Iranian funds to Hamas. A designated terrorist group, the State Department has long accused of supporting Hamas with funds, weapons, and training. Back at the market, 26-year-old Maide, one of an increasing number of empowered young women, openly skirting hijab rules. No, we don't. We Not don't afraid. afraid. No. 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 Uh, we are strong. She says wages are not even close to keeping up with the cost of living. Many of her friends have left the country to find work abroad. Iranian-born Homedra, who lives in the UK, says during her visit here, she has noticed a difference. Certainly, from everybody that I meet and I socialize with, they tell me that everything is expensive, prices change on a daily basis. It's really, you know, because of our currency, it's devaluing on a daily basis. <laughs> Mehdi, who works at this sweets shop, tells me we are making just enough not to die. Mehdi, unsure of who or what to blame for Iran's economic strain, is convinced U.S. sanctions are making matters worse. Instability politically and economically, with no clear end in sight. Our thanks to Mola Lange for that report. And still ahead here on Prime, two young boys not nearly old enough to drive stole a car at gunpoint. What happened next caught on camera. But next, college basketball superstar Caitlin Clark's new record and her smash record smashing season two by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. And that's sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here.
ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail in North Charleston, South Carolina, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Here comes Clark. How will she go for history? <laughs> That is Iowa's Caitlin Clark becoming the all-time leading scorer in NCAA Division I women's basketball history last night during the Hawkeyes' home win over Michigan. A very big night for what has been a very big year for Caitlin Clark in Iowa. So let's take a look by the numbers. Two minutes and 12 seconds of game time is all it took for Clark to score eight points that she needed to beat the record. She surpassed Kelsey Plum, who'd previously held that record for seven years. But Clark was far from done after those eight points. She finished the game with a personal best 40 nine points, which is also a single game record for Iowa. Now, Caitlin Clark is currently at 3,569 career points and counting. She has made Iowa basketball too along the way a very hot ticket. The Hawkeyes recently announced 30 of their last 32 regular season games are going to be sellouts or set attendance records. And getting into last night's game was not cheap. $375 on average for week uh, for week of game tickets. That's according to ticketing technology company Logitix. And there is still more history within reach for Caitlin Clark. She is 99 points away from surpassing Pete Maravich's longtime scoring record. That's among all Division I basketball players, men and women. And Iowa still has four regular season games left, plus the conference tournament and the NCAA tournament. So she has a pretty good shot at breaking that record, too. Our congratulations to Caitlin, one of the most fun basketball players to watch there has ever been. And we have much more ahead here on Prime. The murder of a young African-American husband father and soldier that set off an investigation and a discovery that shocked everyone involved. But next, a very big surprise visitor for children injured in the Kansas City shooting. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I have a point of contact. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. Privilege. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh, my God, look. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. It was a love story that started in church and ended with murder. Please tell me this isn't real. What secrets were about to be revealed? The truth would be almost too strange to believe. Bad Romance, all new, Monday night on ABC. Sunday morning, the 2024 race, Trump's legal battles, Ukraine, Israel, the border, and the funding fight, and millions listen to him. Now, Charlemagne the God from The Breakfast Club on the election ahead, Sunday on ABC's This Week.
do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting. Breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. The shocking video of the moment two young teens try to steal a car at gunpoint, a surprise visitor for children injured in the Kansas City shooting, and the wild new floor coming to the NBA. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Senator Joe Manchin, the Democrat from West Virginia, announced he will not launch a 2024 bid for the White House as an independent. Manchin announced last year that he would not seek re-election for his Senate seat, fueling speculation over whether he planned to mount a third-party White House bid. But today, he said the system is not set up for a third-party candidate. I just don't think it's the right time. Instead, Manchin said he will focus his efforts on his daughter's super PAC called Americans Together. Seattle police have arrested a 12-year-old and 13-year-old boy after they stole a car from a woman at gunpoint, tried to steal a car from a man at gunpoint, and then led officers on a chase before trying to run away. He's gonna go. Dramatic video shows officers tracking down the two boys, both armed, and arresting them. Get on the, ground. the two are charged with robbery and unlawful possession of a firearm. The 13-year-old is also charged with attempting to elude a police vehicle. Authorities say two people have been found shot dead in a dorm room at the University of Colorado. The case is being treated as an isolated incident, and there's no ongoing threat to the community, according to police. While the campus lockdown has been lifted, classes are canceled for the rest of the day. Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes and his wife Brittany visited kids injured by Wednesday's shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs parade. They were pictured with children of the Reyes family, whose 8 and 10 year old daughters were both shot in the leg. In a statement, the family said the girls are making good progress. Two juveniles were charged in Wednesday's shooting that left one dead and 22 injured. This is happening at MetLife Stadium. It's typically home to the New York Jets, the Giants, often Michael Strahan. But this weekend, it's hosting outdoor hockey. So we have a time lapse here. MetLife converting from a football field into an ice rink. They're going to be expecting 140,000 fans over two days. First, the New Jersey Devils hosting the Philadelphia Flyers at 8 o'clock Saturday night. You can watch it on ABC. And then Sunday, the New York Rangers play the New York Islanders at 3 o'clock p.m. That's also on ABC. Those attending and playing during the NBA's All-Star Weekend are in for a surprise. A state-of-the-art LED court is set to make its debut at Lucas Oil Stadium tonight. The court is made of two layers of laminated safety glass and is expected to feel the same as a regular court when players are using it. The NBA says the immersive sports floor is designed to enhance the fan experience in arena and on broadcast through its interactive displays. Tonight on 2020, John Quinones reports on a young African-American husband, father, and soldier who's murdered while home for the holidays. Never before seen interrogation tapes and extensive police body camera footage reveal a twisted tale of heartache and greed. Here's a clip of how this father remembers his son. Uh, it was bad. Like the news spread it fast. Everybody was crying and screaming and falling everywhere. Um, Why is it important to you to talk about it? What do you want people to know about this story? Well, I feel like I owe it to my son. He made me a proud father. He just did everything that he needed to do and was so successful. I feel like I want everybody to know about him. So I won't ever stop talking about him. And it's tough being good in, in these communities sometimes. Yeah, when you come from where we come from, you just don't have a child that that succeeds um, to that level. It's exceptional. Definitely. Our thanks to John Quinones. 
Next tonight, we want to talk about AI, and every day there seems to be some kind of new artificial intelligence headline. So we're going to take a look back at what happened for the entire week. We want to welcome in ABC senior reporter Emmanuel Saliba. Emmanuel, thanks so much for being here. Of course. We're talking big picture here first, not necessarily the technological advancement, but the mm -hmm. fact that 20 of these leading companies have signed this pledge that they're going to prevent deceptive AI from interfering with the upcoming election or other elections happening around the world. Broadly, what does that mean and how is it possible? So that was a huge announcement. Uh, these companies, Meta, Google, X, TikTok, all came together and said, we're going to work to prevent deceptive AI from interfering in our elections. Because globally, this year, 4 billion people in uh, 40 countries around the world are expected to vote. Mm -hmm. And AI is going to play a really big role, potentially, in swaying some of those votes. And so they've decided to take action to make eight commitments to, from everywhere from labeling to working on detecting this content online um, to developing new technology and uh, working together to prevent the, this deceptive this deceptive content for impacting our elections. And this is only election specific. It's not general to artificial intelligence <laughs> right. content. Uh, and other deceptive information, not election, not related, election related, which could still be its own thing. And there yes. was, I saw this on my Twitter or my X feed the other day, this new development from, I believe, OpenAI mm. of text to video. Yes. Let's just start with what is it and how does it work? It's very similar to text to image. Essentially, it's using a verbal cue or a text prompt to ask these generative AI tools to create a piece of video. Um, OpenAI unveiled their um, tool called Sora. It's not publicly available right now, but they wanted to show what capacity it had to create um, incredibly realistic video. Mm -hmm. um, but OpenAI isn't the only tool out there. There are others. Runway, uh, Pika Labs have been working on these text-to-video tools for months, and experts are concerned about, you know, the risks involved with right. releasing that kind of technology in the wild. Uh, I think everyone is marveling at how fast these things can develop. Are we keeping up with the ability to detect that it's fake? It's a cat and mouse game because F, with every new model, the detection tool has to re be retrained to detect it. Mm -hmm. But there are efforts like these 20 companies coming together and another coalition of companies that are creating um, metadata files that you can attach to these videos and to these images and label them as AI-generated content. And as it travels through the internet, whether it's on X, mm -hmm. on Meta, on your phone, that information is going to be on that image right. so that if a platform decides, hey, I want the user to know, they can do that. Gotcha. They can let us know that this is an AI generator. Kind of like a serial number for a gun. It's like a digital, yeah, or like a digital, digital nutrition label. It would have all of the information gotcha. listed of who created it, how, mm -hmm. um, if it was altered. So really right now we're seeing a push for companies and publishers to make that information Available. Gotcha. We can certainly understand why. I have a million follow-up questions, but we'll save it for <laughs> okay. another weekly roundup. Yes. Emmanuel Saliba, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And finally, tonight it's Friday night, so how about we close out with a little pop music, a little bit of glitter, a little bit of guts. We're talking with singer-songwriter Chapel Roan, who is being called pop's next big thing. She's also being called an absolute favorite by Elton John. And a lot of it is because of her, the success of her first studio album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess. It features some extremely catchy singles like Red Wine Supernova. Take a listen. It's a jam. Pop Powerhouse Chapel Run, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. For Wonderful having. to meet you. Thank you. You too. Uh, uh, one of my favorite things to do at the end of every year is read the best of lists of albums and songs, and you could not find one that did not have that song on Thank it. Thank you. Uh, that was crazy, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, that's just my first question. With all of this success and the praise, I mentioned the Elton John praise. Uh, there's no better endorsement. How does it feel riding the wave right now? I feel very prepared. I've been doing this for a decade. Yeah. Um, I've been through like a major label deal already mm -hmm. and dropped and then another major label deal. So I think if this were to happen when I was hoping it would happen when I was like 17, I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. So I'm really able to enjoy yeah. it because I feel ready. You were discovered from YouTube first. Yeah. 
got that deal 17, move out to LA, and then it falls through. You go back to Missouri. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people would say they feel prepared when they finally hit the kind of success that you have. In 2020, I ran out of money like everybody did. Right. And I was a barista working the drive through back in Missouri. And um, yeah, I just, it was, it was either give it one more shot or maybe go to school to be a biologist or something. Right, which would have been great. Which would have been awesome. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about them, maybe some of your favorites? Oh, well, I just started doing themes because I love dressing up. I want any excuse to dress up. And I love dressing up for concerts. So all of my themes for my concerts go along with my songs. And I have like Pink Pony Club, this Pink Cowgirl themed. We've got Casual, we've got Super Graphic Ultra Modern Girl, which is one of my songs, and it's like alien girly. Um, we have Naked in Manhattan, um, which is Slumber Party. It seems like a, a, an incredibly supportive community also, like super positive. Everybody's having a great time lifting each other up. On top of your own tour, yes. opening for Olivia Rodrigo at some of these gigantic stadiums around the country. Are you prepared for that? You know what? It's gonna be fine. That's all I'm saying in my head over and over again. I've never played an arena. I am so grateful to be able to do this. Um, and I think once I do it once, it'll be fine. But it's scary to think about 20,000 people. Yeah. Everyone says that has played an arena that um, you can't see past the, thousand, the first thousand anyway, so it doesn't really matter. The album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess. You're from Willard, Missouri. Population mm -hmm. about 6,000. I'm sure it's a wonderful place. Shout out to your grandmothers that watch Good Morning America today. Uh, thank you, grandmas. Uh, I don't know that a ton of uh, pop superstars come out of Willard, Missouri. How do you feel like it shapes you and your songwriting? I think that the pendulum swung. I was I was so like scared and, and just like so reserved and I just wanted to be do everything right all the time and not ruffle any feathers. And I think the second I left, the pendulum swung so far that I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm out and proud. And also, I'm going to be a drag queen. And also, I'm going to say the raunchiest lyrics you've ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmas, like, maybe aren't, like, stoked on that part. But <laughs> they like when I dress up. Listen, it's a give and take. <laughs> you Look, I love where I came from because I have an incredible perspective on the Midwest, which I think a lot of people on the coasts kind of, you know, put all Midwesterners in one type of category. Mm -hmm. But there are drag queens, there are people who are trans, there are massive queer communities that are just kind of hidden away in these teeny tiny towns. And I feel like that's who my real community is, and I feel like that's what the community feels like at the shows. All the people who maybe aren't allowed to be out and proud all the time. Right, and I know that you've done some shows specifically designed to raise some money for some of those groups. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I did like a fundraiser for my hometown, um, one of the like queer charities there, but a portion of every ticket for my past tours has actually gone to um, a New York City a black trans charity called For the Girls. Mm. And I just think it's important to give back to the queer community. They give everything to me. Um, it's <laughs> like, it's my duty, I feel like, mm -hmm. to give back to the community. Yeah. Hello again to your grandmothers. The album is The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess. You can listen to it anywhere you stream your music. It's Chapel Road. Thanks so much for being here on a Friday night. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Trevor Alt. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night and a great weekend. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen.